question. Limitations. What are your limitations? I want you to pause and think, what are your limitations? You're going to see me use terms today, weakness. Uh, I wish I had to use the terms limitation. It's funny when you prep, you prep all week for a sermon and then many times I'll sit down super early this morning, have a cup of coffee and I'm sitting, I'm going through my notes and, and I'm like, ah. Uh. I should call this something else today. So I I change my message all the time. I'm changing it as we speak right now. Limitations and weaknesses in an American mentality, I believe, are considered the same thing. Uh, When I say weakness throughout this message, I don't want you to be thinking about spiritual weakness, immaturity. That's something that you can change. You know, whatever sin may be your trapping, it's always tapping on your shoulder a little bit. And every single one of us have different avenues where we are tempted. And that's very normal. It's not a sin to be tempted. But when I use the terms limitations and weakness today, I don't want you to think about those things that you can change, that you can grow up, that you can conquer. I'm talking about some limitations you may have in your life, and and there's a fine line here because there's some limitations that I do want to refer to that you could grow out of, and and by limitations. So I don't know if that makes any sense. Just pause and think to yourself right now. And I, on a on a napkin, not a napkin, an envelope. This morning I wrote down some things. Uh, physical limitations. What do you use as an excuse sometimes as a limitation in your life? Age limitations, young or old. Uh, fear, you wrestle with fear, health issues. Oh, I'm not very good at that. I'm not a pro at that, so I shouldn't do that. What are limitations in your life? And I want you to think through a phrase. We'll, uh, I may not quote it exactly right now until we get to the slide. But is it possible that the limitations God allows in our lives are really blessings in disguise? Have you ever thought about thanking God and being grateful for your limitations. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. I want to pause. If we're not careful, we'll show up weekend after weekend after weekend, or we'll go online and listen to the message, and we'll kind of forget what it's all about right away. So I just wanted to go back. Are you still pausing and thinking? We're going through every teaching and command of Jesus. This is stuff we should not be forgetting. We're going to. We should always be working on why. You can bring that up, Pavia. Don't worry about that. Should always be working on the teachings and the commands of Jesus because he said, if you love me, obey me. And uh, I'm so easily distracted. Pavia, you were being respectful, and now I've lost my train of thought, and I asked you to come up. What was I saying? Ah, messages from the past. Remember we talked about the pigs destroyed, jumped over the cliff, the demons came inside of them, and I asked, what is God trying to destroy in your life to make you better, to catch your attention? He'll do that on occasion. He does not care about our comfort, he cares about our character, and it's in our character that he'll always work on. And then we talked a week later, Jesus is a repo man. What is Jesus trying to repossess in your life that you've kind of hogged to yourself Last week we talked about new wine, old wine skins, uh, and that kind of chat. And today we're going to talk about limitations in an interesting way. Stand with me as we just stand out of reverence for Jesus' teaching on this first one. We're going to read Matthew chapter 9, verses 18 through 26. Here it is. As Jesus was saying this, the leader of a synagogue came and he knelt before Jesus. And he says, My daughter has just died. You got kids? My daughter has just died. This is a heavy moment. But you can bring her back to life again if you just come and lay your hand on her, the leader of the synagogue says. So Jesus and his disciples, they got up and they went with him. I could preach an entire message just on that. I'm not hitting that avenue today. Jesus is remarkable. He was a man on a mission. He had major work to do, like take all of the world's sins, put them on his shoulders, and kill them all through his death. I mean, that's a major mission. He had, if anybody had any right to keep his eyes on the end result and blaze a trail and ignore everybody around him, it would be Jesus in that moment. But he always stopped. He always stopped to, to serve, to love, to heal. Ah, be careful following the steps of Jesus. It's more important to follow the stops of Jesus. Let's be like him. That's a whole other message another time. But just then, so they got up left and they were going to go see what they could do about this girl who had just died. 
Just then, a woman who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, I looked it up in the original languages, and it says hemorrhaging for 12 years. Bleeding came, she uh, she came up from behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe, for she thought, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Well, Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, daughter, be encouraged. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus arrived at the official's home, I hope this is on DVD someday. We can watch it it's, you know, in heaven. It'd be really cool. He saw the noisy crowd and he heard the funeral music. Now, the scriptures have it as an exclamation point. We don't know if he said it that way or not. Get out, he told them. Kind of rude. When's the last time you did that at a funeral? How's that going to work for us? <laughs> Jesus knew how to take charge. This girl isn't dead, he says. She's only asleep. Now, here's probably what we would do. I, I would, I confess. But the crowd laughed at him. I mean, come on. She's not asleep. And after the crowd was put outside, however, Jesus went back in. He took the girl by the hand, and she stood up. The report of this miracle swept through the entire countryside. Let's pray real quick. Father in heaven, in the next few moments, help us completely understand our limitations and never let us be held back by them again. Lord, we love you. We're grateful for you. Thanks for this moment where we as your church are gathered inside the walls of this building. May you be here amongst us and would you do your what I call your magic, Lord, and work on every single one of our hearts and our minds at the same time and help us be better as we leave here in just a few moments. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and be seated. Sorry I didn't advance that last slide for you. Are you thinking about your limitations? I want to pause for a second. And I want you to, this prayer shawl, the reason I had Keith get it, I'd, I'd gone to the Holy Lands, and you could get one of these as well from the Holy Lands if you ever go, and you probably go to a Christian bookstore and get one. It's called a tallit, and, and if you, this is how they would have wore it. Sometimes they would wear it over their head, uh, but this is how they would wear it. And there's a passage I just want to read to you, thinking about the lady who is hemorrhaging. And she must have known her scriptures, her Old Testament scriptures. The New Testament scriptures hadn't been written yet. She must have known this passage. It's Malachi. Keith, you're Italian. I heard there's another Italian in the room here somewhere. That's pronounced Malachi for you guys. It's Malachi, all right, but I say Malachi. 4.2 says this. Uh, Let me get there. I'll start with verse 1. I like to keep things in context. The Lord of heaven's army says the day of judgment is coming burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. They will be consumed, roots, branches, and all. Verse 2, but for you who fear my name, God writes, the son of righteousness. So this is, this is in Malachi. Just after Malachi, God goes silent for 400 years. We don't know why for sure, but he's preparing the son of God to be born, to be the savior, Messiah of the world. But for those of you who fear my name, the Son of Righteous will rise with healing in his wings. I want you to think for a minute, wings. This lady knew that scripture, and she must have trusted Jesus to be the Messiah, the foretold one coming to Malachi. For all she wanted to do, she didn't want attention. She snuck up behind him, and you can read about it in other passages. I believe it's in Mark chapter 5, where it really gives detail, where, where Jesus is like, somebody touched me. And the apostles are like, Jesus, are you crazy? The crowd is pushing on in on you. Everybody's touching you. No, 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 no. I felt power go out from me. Well, all she did was touch one of the, these, these tassels on the end are called the seat seats. I'm sure that's what she was trying to just touch, their special prayer and power in a Jewish culture of what they believe. And every one of these markings believes something or means something to them in their prayer. All she wanted to do was get up and touch the fringe. Uh, This is a shorter one. They made some that were long that would flow down with the robe. It must have been flowing behind him. And all she wanted to do, healing in his wings, that's what she wanted to do. It's fascinating. This in uh, New Testament culture is called a tent And if you read in the passage, I don't don't know if you've seen it. I I wrote it down. It's in Acts 18. I don't have to read it today, but Paul is considered a tent maker. And some of us are thinking camping. 
Because we think like Americans, he, oh, Paul made tents. No, he made prayer shawls. This is what Paul made on a side job, and he traveled around the world and preached the good news of Christ. And to make a little money on the side, because many times Paul talks about refusing money for preaching, you know. And so he had a side job, and he was making talits, prayer shawls, a.k.a. tents, a tent maker. Clear as mud? Another message another time? Anyway, sometimes I, that's kind of cool to learn some of that stuff. How does it affect our personal lives? I don't know. It just makes us all sound really smart. You know? But in all reality, it's kind of a cool detail that when you're reading through it, it sometimes helps to understand culture, and it kind of makes the Bible come to life. And again, I don't know the dates yet, but when we go to the Holy Lands, it's my understanding you, this, this church has never gone as a group. You know, we got to go, 40 or 50 of us, fit on one bus, have a blast, 12 days, stay in beautiful places, eat amazing food, and stand on the ground where Jesus stood and learn things like that in that culture. So anyway, let's get to the point. A weakness. A weakness is any limitation in my life that I've inherited or I can't change. And just because you can't change it doesn't mean it can't be used for good. But limitations are things that are just innate in you, and they've tripped you up over and over and over. I don't know what yours are. You're going to have to think of them yourself. And I've discovered in my own life that, that either I'm a slightly arrogant or I've learned in maturing in my faith in Christ that my limitations are actually gifts, and I sometimes get to the point where I don't think I have limitations. You just move forward and kick butt in Jesus' name. But as I paused this week and thought, I thought, whoa, I do. I've got some serious limitations. And I found myself having not thought of them in a long time. And I'm thinking you and I are a lot alike, whether you want to admit that or not. You know, We're a lot alike. And you probably have limitations. We know you have limitations. We all do. When's the last time you thought about them and considered them a gift, a blessing? The, the limitations God allows in our lives are actually blessings in disguise. Let's talk about that a little bit. So when you hear this story, you hear this story of a synagogue leader. I mean, this is a guy that has a potential to be extremely prideful. He probably has all, in fact, I know, 613 laws of the Old Testament completely memorized. He's a leader of the synagogue where everybody in the Jewish culture showed up and they held him in high regard. Most leaders in the synagogue, when Jesus shows up, rejected him. But isn't it interesting? Maybe he is one who rejected him at one point, right up until his daughter died. Some of us sometimes will ask, why do bad things happen in my life? And I don't know how else other than say it. God can handle you being mad at him. He doesn't panic if you're mad at him. (laughs) He doesn't panic if you don't believe in him. Think about that. God might feel sadness if you do hate him or if you don't love him or if you've rejected him. He feels sadness not because he needs you or me. He created us. God, what does he need? He might feel tremendous sadness that you've rejected him, though, because he knows how good he would be for you. I said it a month ago or whatever. It would be like if engine oil could feel. And you chose not to put, and you're a Mustang, or you pick your favorite car. And you chose not to put engine oil. The engine oil's like, it's not weeping, but it's like, boy, how's that going to work for you? Good luck with that kind of thing. And I don't think God says it with a chip on his shoulder at all. When we don't fully devote ourselves to God, to Jesus Christ, to his way of living, it hurts him because he knows how good he would be for you or for me. Fair enough? And so as we look through this, I want you to think about limitations. God showed up so powerfully because of limitations. This synagogue leader, he falls, he he comes forward. He could have demanded. Uh, He was a synagogue leader. Jesus claimed to be Jewish. He could have demanded. But no, he got down. He humbled himself as, as a synagogue leader, and he got down on his knees in front of a ginormous crowd humbled himself, recognized his limitation, and his limitation was, as a powerful leader, he couldn't control everything, especially the life of his daughter, and it humbled him. And I didn't finish my statement. Sometimes God might allow tough things to happen in our lives, and I don't mean it in a cold-hearted way, 
But God does not care about our comforts, especially us as Americans. We are so comfortable, even in our worst conditions. God doesn't care about our comfort, and sometimes He might allow tough things to be taken from us, some bad things to happen around us, because He wants us on our knees before Him, fully submitting and recognizing we are not God, He is. And if we would just let go of some things in life and live day by day by day for Him. So I, we couldn't even begin to predict the ways and the whys of God in a lot of things. But might it be sometimes our limitations, that it's in those limitations, when things get really bad, that we hit rock bottom, we're on our knees and we have nowhere to, but to look then up. And God would say, I got you. Thank you for finally leaning in on me and looking up. And in American society, sometimes in our lives it has to get really bad before we begin to fully let go and trust God. Fair enough? Limitations. And so I look at this situation and I, I think of Jairus, that's his name, the synagogue leader, and, and how he humbled himself. And then I, I look at a woman who, who in this story for 12 years is hemorrhaging, bleeding out, and she has no control over that. And she just, in, the, in, in her limitation, sneaks in through the crowd. I'm assuming she got down on all fours, is coming through, and it just, just catch that seat seat. Just catch it. Just touch it. There's healing in his wings. And can you imagine right when she touched it? I mean, it would be a great movie scene where they can add all the cool stuff where she would have felt it. Jesus felt it coming out of him. She had to have felt that. And when you read Mark and some of the other parallels, Jesus turns around. Can you imagine the terror this poor elderly woman felt when the one who just healed her is like, who touched me? And the apostles are like, Jesus, are you crazy? everybody's touching you. No, 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 I felt power. And she just must have scrambled, got before him, and it's like, it was me, daughter. You know, you expect a, in our American culture, you expect a smack back from somebody, at least a sharp tongue or something. He's like, daughter, your faith has healed you. Oh, what a cool moment that must have been. So I want to talk about limitations. What are yours? And so back on the screen, a weakness is any limitation in my life that I've inherited or that I can't change. How can Jesus change my limitation or my weakness? He can change it. You can't. And by change it, it might simply mean use it in a better way. Make sense? Change the use of it. No longer a limitation, but it becomes a blessing and a strength of yours. Just keep following my train of thought as I type out some thoughts here. Most modern books, most movies will demonstrate to us, be confident, never admit your fear, never show weakness. Jesus, however had a different style. And this is exactly where I would have preferred not to use weakness. I should have used limitation. So just shift with me. He led from a position of limitation, becoming a servant. How can we do this too? He led from a position of weakness. It's still fair to use that term. The Son of God, the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars, has to come down and serve us, washing the feet of even his enemy. Especially in American culture, we'd be saying, boy, he's weak. Nice guys finish last. Good luck with that, Jesus. That's the American mentality. So moving forward. Talking about strengths develops competition. We're getting ready to go into our life group uh, season, if you will. I am convinced the best life change happens in discussion of the Scripture, how it affects you personally with others in the room. Incredible to have time in the morning, no doubt about it. Having God speak to you or in the evening, whenever you do, 15 minutes in the Word of God, journaling out thoughts, using the life journals. But it is a whole nother level now to say, I'm going to take what I'm learning. I'm going to take what I'm hearing from this message. I'm keeping little notes, and I can't wait to talk about it with a group of 8 to 12 people. If you have more than 12 people in your group, you think you're better than Jesus. He only kept 12 around him regularly. Okay? If you have 24 or 30 in your group, that's called a church, not a small group, not a life group, all right? And so I just want to encourage you, and, and in your group settings, to talk about what we're talking about here, to be vulnerable and transparent is risky. But, but here's the truth of it. Talking about strengths develops competition amongst us. We are a competitive spirit. I'm using a lot of American thinking today. I'm talking about it a lot, and I love everything about America. But if we're not careful, we'll think that, that strength is how we conquer 
Well, maybe in America, but God doesn't think America. He thinks through the world and he, he thinks through his ways. Talking about strengths develops competition. Admitting weakness develops community. Develops community. So keep, keep following. If I admit my weaknesses and I live in humility with a desire to serve others, God's power and his goodness will become obvious in my life. Marinate in that a little bit. If I admit my weaknesses and I live in humility with the desire to serve others, God's power and his goodness will become obvious in my life. But what if somebody takes advantage of me? What if somebody, what if, what if? That might be a limitation you're struggling with, trying to control everything. Admitting my weakness, living in humility with the desire to serve others, God's power and goodness will become obvious in my life. You would not be here if you did not want God's goodness and His power to be obvious in your life. All kinds of things you could have done this weekend. You're here. I say, guaranteeing you heaven on Labor Day weekend at church. So again, to repeat, by weakness, I do not mean character flaws that can be changed. I'm addicted to pornography. I'm going to let God's, God's power show through this one. No, it doesn't work that way. Whatever your sin is, I feel like having adultery today, committing adultery. God's power is going to be evident through this. No, it doesn't work that way. That is sin. It is evil. Call it what it is. I'm simply talking limitations by weakness today. I do not mean character flaws that can be changed by you maturing and growing and repenting. I mean any limitation or weakness in my life that I inherited, did not ask for, and it seems I cannot change it, but possibly God can. So what can I do to allow God's power and goodness to become more obvious in my life? What can you do to allow God's power and goodness to become more obvious in my life? Just three things. You might want to write these down. There's no space. It would be perfect discussion in a life group, but they're not starting for a couple weeks. Maybe you do some Bible study this week out of it. It's very discouraging for pastors to know that by Tuesday, everything I say, about 85 to 90% of it is completely forgotten by Tuesday. There's strategy in sermon-based series, sermon-based series, sermon-based life group studies that we talk about biblical tough stuff on Sunday and Mon Sunday night through all the way through next Saturday night, depending on when your life group meets, you break it down even further. You look up other Bible verses about it. You become vulnerable and transparent and talk about this material very clearly. You can do historical studies too. Nothing wrong with that. I think that's a great time to do that in private. Sometimes it's fun to pull out the history of things. And there's a moment of that that adds some wow factor, some cool factor. But if that's all that it is, then we're just in history class, not in life change class, if you will. I must admit my weaknesses, number one. Which means I've got to stop pretending that I have it all together. Do you? I'm not. I don't. I, 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 you know how you argue with yourself sometimes? Some things you should say, some things you shouldn't. I'm arguing with myself right now, but I think this is a great one because I know my predecessor in this church, Pastor Don Lawrence, man, no, none of us are perfect. But if there's anybody close, that stinking guy, he's a good man. Is he not? And those of you who know him. He's really, really a good man. And uh, I don't know. I'm just coming up sharing my weaknesses. And, I'm gonna, and I think as I've talked with people over the last year about transition, transition differences, I've had some people say, you can't say that from the stage. And I'm like, I'm sorry Don Lawrence was such a good, good man. I'm not. <laughs> and I'm just going to tell you my junk, all right? And, and I've determined along the way, we're all messed up, we're all weird, we're all screwed up, just in different ways. And I think we as a church, maybe this is a moment where I say you, I don't like to use the word you very often, might benefit in your life if you've been pretending that you have it all together, stop it. Stop it. We know better. All right? And the next one, hoping that my weakness will just go away. It doesn't just go away. Pretending and hoping will leave you empty inside. Let's read a passage. Let, look at, uh, let's look at a scriptural precedent that sets what I just talked about. 2 Corinthians 
2 Corinthians chapter 2. I don't have this on our screen, so just listen along. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. We are using the Uversion app now. If you go in, you Type, uh, you hit your Uversion app. You can locate the map. Will pop it up. Christ Church of Fountain Hills. Click it. All the message notes. All these things are right on the Uversion app. You can follow along if you want it there. Second uh, Corinthians two one through five. But I think you'll find even in the Uversion it won't be there because I changed this up after I'd already submitted my stuff to the screen. Here it is. So I decided, Paul writes, that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. <laughs> Not complimented himself there. For if I cause you grief, who will make me glad? Certainly not someone I have grieved. And that is why I wrote to you as I did, so that when I do come, I won't be grieved by the very ones who ought to give me the greatest joy. Surely you all know that my joy comes from your being joyful. I wrote that letter in great anguish with a troubled heart and many tears. I didn't want to greet you, uh, but let you know how much I love you. I'm thinking that's not the right passage. Let me go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 instead of 2. I can still use that passage where Paul used his, he uses timidity and trembling. Uh, yep, I read you the wrong passage. Listen, listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, same verses, 1 through 5. When I first came to you, dear brothers and sisters, I didn't use lofty words. Impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan. I decided that while I was with you, I'd forget everything except Jesus Christ. How many of us rely on our strengths? We rely on what we're good at to move us forward. Nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't necessarily show the glory of God when we use our own strengths, unless you're giving credit while you're using that strength. I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Jesus, the one who was crucified. No, I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling. And my message and my preaching were very plain. And rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Are you acknowledging your limitations? Look at number two. Are you grateful for your limitations and your weaknesses. Think about, am I grateful for them? This scripture stuff is strange. God's way is so different than mankind's way. Are you grateful for your limitations and your weaknesses? Here's a Rick Warren statement, what I started the message off with. The weaknesses God allows in our lives are actually blessings in disguise. There's a lot of truth in that sentence. Listen to 2 Corinthians. Now I have fear that I have the right passage written down. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Listen to verses 5 through 10. It's jumping right into the middle of some context. You can read from the very beginning. It says, that experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to boast about that experience, he says. I will boast only about my weakness, limitations. If I wanted to boast, I would be no, I would, I would be no fool in doing so, because I'd be telling the truth, but I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take this limitation away from me. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in your limitations. Are you grateful for your limitation? What are they? And are you trusting God in them in security? Many of us are afraid to acknowledge our limitations because we feel like the world is going to pick on us with those, or we have our identity based in, in our strengths. And it's, it's literally, if you just live through your limitation and people pick on that or take advantage of you, Jesus is your only audience. Who cares what people think of you? If Jesus is your number one audience, there is such freedom to live when Jesus is your only audience. Who cares about your limitations and your weaknesses? You serve Him and you humbly move forward and you can't control how people respond to you anyway. I wish, I wish, I wish in high school I would have lived that kind of life. The fear of living in how other people kids, students, teenagers felt of me was tremendous 
And I covered it up with sticking my chest out and fighting and good athletics. And I was just a scared kid. I should have just lived with Jesus as my only audience. And he is the only one we should want to please. Moving on. Are you grateful for your weakness? Number three, and we're going to wrap this up. Are you openly sharing your weakness? What? Are you openly sharing your weakness? There's not very many spots in American culture where you get to do that in a place that's, I don't know what the word is, secure, safe. It really is what a life group's meant to be about. A place for you to show up and share your junk and not get judged, kicked out, made fun of, bullied. That's really what life groups are about. Where else do you get to do such a thing? Go into a circle and say, I really sucked this week. And I need your help. And nobody points, nobody laughs. Everybody just like, you got this, Renner. We got this together. That is a dream come true life group. I must openly share my weakness. Refusing to be vulnerable is dishonest. Refusing uh, to be vulnerable is hypocritical. Because I know inside you are vulnerable, and so am I. You are human. Your humanity is one of your greatest assets. Think about that. Our humanity is one of our greatest assets. We are God's masterpiece, His prized possession in all of creation. Pretending to be perfect hurts your impact. Be real. I must have been frustrated when I typed this. Good grief. <laughs> I crack myself up sometimes. Hebrews 4, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our limitations. Pause and think on that. It's, weird. it's worded weird. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Finish it out. It makes more sense. But we have one who has been tested. Some scripture translations say tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So pause for a second. A lot of people don't think about this this way. I just get really, uh, I always take things almost too far, but it gets your attention. Do you think Jesus was sexually tempted ever? Can I say that about Jesus in church? Yeah. The Bible, guided and written through the direction and the inspiration of Jesus himself, says, but we have a Messiah, Jesus, tested in every way, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. I'll share a quick story because I'm actually getting out of here fairly early. Wow. We have a song to sing yet. So come on up here, guys. It'll hold me accountable to get done. Bo, say it ain't so. Bo Higgleman is back. How cool is that, huh? Yeah. What was I saying? Ah, ah, ah. Uh, I had a lady after reading this passage. This was years ago. Say... You read that passage about the Messiah was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. And she caught me off guard. She said, are you saying Jesus was raped? She goes, I was raped. You're telling me that Jesus can relate. And I paused for a second, and I, I, on my heels. And I'm like, well, I said, you know what? This will shatter your heart a little bit. If you study the Roman Empire... And they're around that year of Jesus' time frame. And I'm just going to say the, the, the sexual promiscuity amongst men to boys, a form of child rape that took place amongst the Roman culture. It's really no different today. We call it sex trafficking today of boys and girls. And if you think that isn't happening, Arizona is a big one. And the number one age group, the average age group of young boys and girls who are being sex trafficked, taken to, to different places in our culture right here in our own towns and being uh, purchased for sex, the average age is 12 and 13 years old. You let that soak in. Uh, we were part of my, at, at the church I led over in, in Surprise. Of, we raised like $165,000 for Project Streetlight, and we heard stories of right there in our local neighborhood of El Mirage, a girl was found kept in a dog cage, fed dog food, 
and she was raped over and over and over, multiple times throughout a day, prostituted out. And every we can't, we got to stop. You can't. She's not prostituted. She's being raped. And and my whole my whole point in in all of this is is in the Roman culture, this was big. We have no idea what happened to Jesus. He was stripped of his clothes for a 24-hour period and held captive. And the Roman guard, very sexual, promiscuous, powerful group of people, you have no idea what happened to Jesus. And I, I, I caught that lady off guard and said, it is possible he was sodomized. Can you imagine the creator of the sun, the moon, and the stars? Can you imagine? And in your mind, that's going to cause you to wrestle. And it will change your very culture in your heart about how you sin and why you sin and should I do that to my Savior. And it will cause you to walk a fine line when you really think about. We in our culture have gotten so used to blood and guts that the crucifixion doesn't bother us so much anymore. I believe God picked the time for Jesus to be brutalized because he knows we as human nature like we're rubberneckers. You always want to see the accident. It's why traffic backs up forever just because there was a rollover. We're all looking for the gore. It gets our attention. God knows that about us. He could have sent Jesus down with lethal, lethal in, in a time where lethal injection and just put him to sleep. Same, same purpose was accomplished. He just went to sleep and took the sins of the world, raised him from the dead later. Why did he send him in such a brutalizing time? Because he needed to catch our attention. How much does God love you that he allowed his son to go through that so that you might be grabbed by, by your attention and you get on your knees and you say, I will follow you. Thank you for the incredible gift that you paid so that I could be free. You were brutalized so that I could be free. That should rock your world a little bit. And it did the lady. And, and she's amazing in her walk and in her faith today. Used to be angry at God. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tested, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. Find boldness in your limitations. Last sentence, and then the worship team is going to lead us in a song called Calvary. And we'll stand and we'll sing it together here in a minute. Just encourage you to dwell on the words. Think about where you're at. Are you grateful for your weaknesses? Can you acknowledge your limitations? Will you be vulnerable? The creator of the sun and the moon and the stars and the creator of your very knitting together as a human being became so extremely vulnerable. Took on all the limitless, or, the, or, the, or the, 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 he just took on every limitation in his life. And he became vulnerable. And we're called to do the same. So maybe today you walk out with this. I used a bunch of F words. I will not allow my failures, my feelings, and my faults to foul up my friendship and forgiveness in Jesus. Maybe you can write that down and remember that this week. I will not allow my failures, my feelings, and my faults to foul up my friendship and my forgiveness in Jesus. Let's pray and let's sing about this. Father in heaven, we love you. Thanks for a great day. Thanks for a moment to be challenged, to understand the depth and the weight of what you went through for each and every one of us. Thank you that you understand our limitations. You can grasp our weaknesses because you became them, Jesus. Thank you. Help us have the courage as the synagogue leader. Help us to have the courage of the lady who is hemorrhaging. That even in our fears and timidity, we can approach you and know that we will encounter a good God, a loving God, a gentle God, patient and forgiving God. That is who you are. Help us fully grasp this. Jesus, it's all for you. We are so grateful for you, Lord. And we look forward to meeting you face to face. And Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing along. I can see clearly my God, you for me. You won't let go.
listen as I pray. 